NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. Thank you for joining us and welcome to our webinar series uh, titled Public Defense Past, Present, and Future. I'm Monica Milton, the Public Defense Counsel for the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Uh, before we begin, I'll just give you all some housekeeping uh, to keep us organized while we have this moderated discussion. As you may have noticed, everyone but the panelists are automatically muted. Their cameras are turned off. If you do have questions for our panelists, we ask that you use the Q&A function. And for questions involving tech issues, please use the chat function. And you can also use the chat function to introduce yourself um, and tell us where you're calling in from. Um, I'll be monitoring the messages and I'll do my best to get to as many of your questions as we can. Uh, this program is being recorded and will be made available on our website for future viewing and sharing. Uh, there is no CLE credit for this webinar. Um, since we only have an hour, I'll give an abridged introduction to our speakers today, um, but I do encourage you all to look at their bios on our website to learn more about the fantastic work they're doing and have done in the, in the defense space. So first I'll introduce Adrian Lobo, who serves on NACL's board of directors and is the co-chair of our diversity committee. She, she currently has her own practice in Las Vegas, Nevada, where she handles state and federal criminal matters. Um, she also has served at the Riverside County and Clerk County PD offices. So Adrian, why don't you kick us off with some introductory remarks and then I'll introduce our panel and begin the moderate discussion. All right, thank you, Monica. Thank you for having me. Um, and good morning or happy lunchtime if you were on the East Coast watching this. Um, my name is Adrian Lobo. I am on the board of directors for NACDL. I am one of the co-chairs for the diversity committee. And yes, Larry Jefferson is a proud member of our committee that I'm happy to work with and by. And today we're here to talk about and celebrate Gideon. It is a 59th anniversary of Gideon and you guys are all on here today because you are all probably public defenders, were public defenders, or if you need that motivation, you're in the right space and place. Um, I can tell you that I've been practicing for 15 years. The first eight years of my practice was as a public defender. And I can tell you that I was one of those people that went to law school with the purpose to create social change, to revolutionize what criminal defense is. I went with the purpose to be a public defender and became that. So I, I understand it is the heart and soul of my practice. And even though I am now in private, uh, practice and have been for many years. It is my heart and soul, and I will always be a PD, ride or die. So um, I wanted to like get all of that out of the way and talk about what you know. I was going to say today, I thought long and hard about what the Sixth Amendment means to me. And as I was getting ready for this, I had so many stories to talk about and that of course, maybe I'll touch upon if time permits. But one of the things that has just taken over and overhauled my entire remarks was watching yesterday what happened um, with Judge Jackson in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. It was appalling. And I think that the Sixth Amendment we saw on national television over and over under attack. Uh, a federal public defender who was doing her job that she is sworn to do to protect her client was questioned at length about how could she be that person who defends child pedophilia? How could she be that person who has taken these repugnant criminal um, clients on and has defended them adequately and competently to the best of her ability? I expected, you know, more. I wanted more from Judge Jackson for us, right? But that's inside of me and that's my wanting and desire because I was screaming at the TV and saying all kinds of things. It motivated me today. One of the messages that I would like to, to be resounding today is that we must now start to be better about our messaging, our PR messaging about what we do. And 
try to constantly break down that stereotype of public pretenders and dump truck attorneys. We must constantly be upholding Gideon, the Constitution, and the search for the truth. We are under attack. It is real. It is calculated. Um, it is purposefully done so that way we are out-resourced and outnumbered and gaslit the entire way through for the people that we represent. We must be loud. We must be saying to the public that we are truth seekers, that we have integrity, and that when we win, the entire system wins because that means that the truth came out and some sort of deficiency in the process was exposed, whether it's factual or systemic. And that's on us. That's our onus. That's our responsibility. And it isn't limited to public defenders. I give the same preaching talk to private practitioners. And if you're not about that life, then we probably aren't even in the same spheres and circles, right? So um, that being said, that's what I can say about the front and center attack that I witnessed yesterday. I can say that it happens in more innocuous ways. And for those of you that are in jurisdictions where you don't get discovery before an offer is made, or you get very limited discovery, and it's a take it or leave it exploding deal, that isn't an attack on the Sixth Amendment. That needs to be strategically attacked through litigation and proper record development. There's other ways that, you know, of course, you know, we suffer sorts of attacks on the six. I think that one of the other ways that we tend to see more is like through the snitches that are used after our clients are already our clients, right? Um, I can tell you that a way that will blow your mind and I will leave you with this remark. Um, the right to counsel is under attack if your client calls you and says that they were moved to the disciplinary housing unit for a silly reason, and in that process that their legal papers were seized and withheld from them and never given back. The right to counsel is under attack when you represent a client who is actually detained for a murder case and homicide detectives come into your client's cell and seize pieces of paper that were prepared for you at your direction and use it for eight months to aid and assist in their investigation. And then the prosecutor fights the unsealing of the affidavit the entire way through. These are intentional interferences and it's so hard to meet that standard. And so I will say one of the things that we need to start doing is systematizing how we lay the records for a Sixth Amendment claim for our client. And it's going to be uncomfortable in spaces, but that is what we do. We're used to being uncomfortable. And if you've been doing this long enough, you get used to it, right? And you also must get used to the fact of having to process the constant trauma that you endure, because that's the other attack on the Sixth Amendment, is not taking care of yourself. We all must do better about that for each other, for ourselves, for our clients. And we have to start thinking of new ways to process this out in a way that is just and humane. And in a way that is, of course, going to take our clients to the place they need to be, but also to propel what the Sixth Amendment in Gideon means to educate the public. I look forward to hearing everybody's remarks today um, that is on this panel. I know that Monica put together some great speakers. One of the reasons I have to go is because the last two examples that I just told you about the commissary move violation and the seizure of the papers pursuant to a search warrant is an active homicide case where I've been defending a client and engaged in an evidentiary hearing for two years on the second claim. This is the same case. So I am with you. If you need a person to rah-rah, to boo-hoo, to strategize with, Monica will give you the contact information. If you need your tribe and you don't have it in your local jurisdiction, 
you will have a tribe with NACDL. And that is why you are obviously here. And I look forward to you um, participating uh, in NACDL. And if you are interested in joining the diversity committee, I'm sure that Larry will talk more about our, some of the stuff that we're doing in that um, section. But I welcome you. I thank you today for your service. I thank you for fighting every single day for people who don't have voices and continuing to do the hard work that is so underappreciated. So thank you sincerely and from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much, Adrian, for giving us that uh, impassioned kickoff. Um, and I hope that, you know, that also inspires all of you um, to also join NACDL and continue to support um, the work that we're doing. Um, I'll just Intr quickly introduce the rest of our panel so that uh, we can get into some moderated discussion. So as Adrian mentioned, um, Larry Jefferson uh, was appointed in April of 2021 by the Washington Supreme Court to become the new director of public defense for the state of Washington. In 2020, Larry was named the attorney of the year and received the Danielle Bigelow Award from the Thurston County Bar Association. He has worked as a public defender in King and Thurston County since 1996. He is a graduate of the Evergreen State College and Seattle University School of Law. He's currently serving as a board member with the National Campaign for Equal Justice and the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Uh, Professor Irene Joe joined the faculty at UC Davis School of Law in 2016. She's widely published and her research focuses on how the design of the criminal process affects the ability of institutional attorneys to manage overwhelming caseloads and comply with the ethical uh, requirements. Uh, Professor Joe is both a line defender and the Assist assistant special litigation counsel at the Orleans Public Defenders. She was also the assistant training director with the Louisiana Public Defender Board. Um, and last but not least, uh, Sean Osei-Owusu is presidential assistant professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania Carey School of Law. Uh, law school. His work sits at the intersection of law, history, and sociology and focuses on how governments meet their legal obligations to provide pro protections and benefits to poor people and racial minorities. He also works on stratification in legal education and the legal uh, profession. So in order to get us started, I wanted to kind of get into the history of indigent defense as um, and how it came to be as we know it today. So I'll start with um, Sean, who writes extensively about um, some of this historical aspect. So uh, Sean, in your article, The Sixth Amendment Facade, you advanced the proposition that race was central to the formation of the right to counsel as we know it today. So I just wanted you to give sort of an overview and an abridged version of your really great article that we'll provide um, on the website. Um, the Sixth Amendment facade, but could you give us an overview of how that right came to be and what you mean by uh, race helping form this indigent defense? Great. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me here, Monica, uh, and I'm just happy to be in conversation with all of you as someone who's been writing about you know, public interest law, indigent defense, and legal aid for about a decade. I'm just greatly appreciative of all the work that everyone on this call is doing. Um, so, you know, my work is about race and legal aid. I'm working on a book about the historical development of legal aid organizations and public defender offices. Um, and part of what I'm trying to do in my work is, is a couple of things. Primarily, kind of challenge the common sense assumption that indigenous defense is just about class and poverty and the inability to afford an attorney. So, most people trace the origins of indigent defense to the creation of the New York Legal Aid Society uh, in the 1870s. And I argue that that history is a century late. And really we see the kind of first episodes of organized legal assistance uh, in, the 17, in the late 1700s with abolitionist societies that provided legal aid to uh, fugitive slaves as well as the white abolitionists who helped them. So, the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society here in Philadelphia, as well as the New York Manumission Society. And, and, and part of what I argue is that work was animated by concerns around race and slavery. Um, if you fast forward about 80 years later um, and look at the Freedmen's Bureau, which was created after the Civil War to help African Americans transition into citizenship, you know, most people recognize the Freedmen's Bureau for its work um, in creating uh, educational institutions. So historically black colleges like Howard University, they recognize it for creating hospitals, 
Um, but the Freedmen's Bureau uh, also provided legal aid to African Americans in the South. Uh, and this is an instance where the federal government is getting involved in the provision of legal services that's tied to these questions around race. Uh, when you look at when the traditional stories of legal aid begin, you know, many of these legal aid societies in the Northeast, in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, et cetera, uh, began in the early 1900s out of a concern for Southern and Eastern Europeans who at the time weren't considered fully white. They were understood as in this interstitial space between being white and not white. And part of that was tied to these questions around immigration and immigrants. Uh, and so many of these societies, again, were organized around questions around race. Uh, up until the 1930s, the Sixth Amendment right to counsel is understood as a negative liberty. So when we talk about the Constitution, we talk about it oftentimes as a charter of negative liberties. So some people disagree with that, but you know, the First Amendment says the federal, that the government can't uh, engage in the exercise of free religion and free speech. The Fourth Amendment says the government can't engage in unreasonable search and seizures. The Sixth Amendment right to counsel, with some, with some exceptions, was understood as this idea that the government can't prevent you from bringing an attorney to court, but not that it had an affirmative obligation. Uh, and so that's how the Supreme Court under, interpreted the Sixth Amendment right to counsel until 1931, during the Great Depression, when nine black boys were accused of raping two white girls in Powell versus Alabama. So the seminal case that changes the how we understand the right to counsel, and this was the, that Powell versus Alabama was strictly about capital cases. Yet and still, the key case when it be, when it comes to integer defense, it's Powell versus Alabama, and what what scholars have argued was the most high profile racially controversial case in the 20th century, maybe with the exception of the O.J. Simpson trial. That case was about race. But, you know, for 30 years, the court kind of hemmed and hawed on how right, hemmed and hawed on how, how far the Sixth Amendment right to counsel should be extended. So they extended to federal crimes in 1938 in a case called Johnson v. Zerks. But in 1942, when they asked to extend the right to counsel to states, they say no, we're not. We're not going to do that. Um, and so, for twenty years, the court has what's called the special circumstances test to decide when counsel should have been provided. So it's essentially an after the fact determination by appellate courts that say, ah, uh, states, you should have provided counsel in these instances. And so, for twenty years, that's the court's jurisprudence: is the special circumstances test. The special circumstances test oftentimes involve black illiterate defendants coming from the South. This was the large majority of the court's Sixth Amendment right to counsel doctrine on um, docket between the 1940s and the 1960s. By the time the early 1960s comes around, man, the, the court composition changes and there are people on the court who say, we need to change this special circumstances test. We can't be dealing with this continuous flow of Black defendants from the South who were saying they should have been appointed counsel. And so part of what they do, part of what they do um, is they select Clarence Gideon as the vehicle to extend a positive right to counsel. And Clarence Gideon's case involved a sympathetic old white man who's accused of larceny. And part of what I talk about is the, the part of what they wanted to do was make this a not controversial case. So they picked Gideon as the vehicle. And part of what I'm saying is that the idea of picking a white person to be your vehicle is a race conscious consideration. Um, and fortunately, the court ruled the right way when it came to Gideon and extended the right to counsel uh, in Gideon versus Wainwright. But what ends up happening is shortly thereafter, you have the civil rights movement, you have the backlash to it, the backlash to the Warren Court Revolution. And then beginning in the 1970s, at the same time, you see a kind of welfare backlash around this idea that black and brown women are taking advantage of the welfare system. You see a similar kinds of arguments made about the criminal justice system. So the idea that, that is that there are these black and brown defendants who are, who are factually guilty, but being found innocent 
because of legal technicalities due to public defenders. And so it's no surprise that in the 1970s and the 1980s, you begin to see a set of decisions that begin to rein in how far the Sixth, right, Sixth Amendment right to counsel should extend. So Scott versus Illinois, which says maybe Sixth Amendment right to counsel applies to some misdemeanors, but not all misdemeanors. Uh, and I think the case that we're most familiar with, Strickland versus Washington, which created the ineffective assistance of counsel test, most people understand it for those detrimental consequences, but people forget that that was also a racially controversial case involving a black guy who killed, who was charged with, who was charged and convicted of three capital offenses. Uh, and so part of what I'm talking about in my work more largely is the way that you know race plays a role in the jurisprudential development of the Sixth Amendment right to counsel, but also how it plays a role in the work of public defense. And oftentimes, you know, the public defenders are working with not only poor client communities, but racial minorities, as well as poor whites, who are oftentimes understood as not racialized. So that's the kind of quick and brief, dirty history of um, uh, the right to counsel and race. Great, thank you, Sean. So um, thanks for, uh, kind of giving us that overview and context for um, how we understand indigent defense um, today. So we get Gideon, um, you know, and it's widely celebrated. It's a popular opinion. Um, why do you feel like today we have not, you know, sort of achieved the promise of Gideon? And I'll just open that up to um, the full panel and get your thoughts. Irene, why don't you take this one? All right, I'd be happy to join it. Um, thank you. First of all, let me let me just thank you all for giving me the opportunity to be part of this panel. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, I'm a fan of, of so many people I see that are attending. And then of course, I'm a fan of the, the people on the panel as well. And, um, and, and Monica Milton for putting this together. You know, I, I actually to go along with sort of what what Sean um, conveyed in his excellent opening words. Um, as much as I celebrate Gideon, I, I think it's important for us to recognize that Gideon didn't really promise us what we can think of as, as, as um, the, the right form of public defense, right? If you think about the environment at the time and how the Gideon decision came to be, it was because the special circumstances test that was set forth in Betts versus Brady, which is really unwieldy, right? And it was a lot of work and they didn't wanna do that work anymore. And so what's an easier way to deal with what they recognize has to be this right to counsel for poor people in state courts um, uh, for you know the people in positions of power who don't want to spend the time and the energy to do that, and it's to provide this you know this general right to counsel for felonies and then extend it to misdemeanors and Argus Singer uh, a few years later, and then just say states you can figure it out right. And so part of what my work does is it looks at that point where the the Supreme Court says yes, there's a right to counsel, but you guys figure it out as sort of the inflection point and where they're saying, do this, you know, we've got to figure out what that means in terms of doing it right. And so we, we have to, we have to, you know, accept Gideon and celebrate Gideon for what it means on a broad sort of theoretical basis, but also recognize that it left a lot of room for us to work in and, 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 and a lot of ways in which we have to address the best way to achieve the right to the effectiveness of counsel for poor people and, and that it didn't just give us an ant like the answer right there. Um, I think that's sort of my short answer for that. I guess what I'll say is number one, uh, I think there's 169 people on here. Some of you I've never met before and I need you to know something. I love you. I love you. All right, in, in a way that either nor you nor I exist. Okay, I love you straightforwardly without complexing your pride. I love you so that when you close your eyes at night, I, I fall asleep. That's how much I love you. We are suffering and we're suffering uh, because we have a country that was built on stealing land from other people, bringing land, uh, bringing people, Africans, stealing their bodies. And, and then we're suffering from stolen labor. So other people coming to this land and working hard, the Chinese, um, women who have not been compensated uh, for their labor. We are suffering 
from those harms. And so, uh, you know, with all these complications with Gideon, of, of, of finding the right vehicle to, uh, to bring it forth through a white man, when we know that this was all racialized from the beginning, these systems were never supposed to work for us. And now what we get to do is create the systems and be restorative in nature to uh, come up with complex ways that we can make the system truly do what it's supposed to do. Because America is supposed to be the land of the free, the home of the brave, liberty and justice for all. Well, let's have some of that liberty. Let's have some of that justice. And, and justice can't be for those who can't afford it. Justice must be for all of us. Uh, and so what we have to do, I think, with our public defense systems is uh, not just wait until our arraignment in order for us to meet our client, but where can we get before that? Uh, because we know that when we're dealing with root causes of crime, that that's where we can get our healing. And so for me, it's where we can take uh, this, this Gideon's uh, promise, because Gideon should be the floor. The Constitution should be the floor. We should strive for more than that. We should strive to help people uh, when they need it. And we know that people get the help when they have a representative. And that representative is counsel. Thank you so much. Um, Sean, did you want to jump in on that as well? Yeah, I mean, I would just say uh, ditto to what Irene um, and Larry said. And, you know, I think I'd add, I think, you know, one of the challenges, I mean, I think there are a couple of challenges. I think the first is that you know, part of it is tied to who uh, Indigenous Defense supports, and that's people who are accused of crimes, who are not politically popular, um, who don't have the same kinds of basis of institutional organization that other kind of political interests might have. Uh, so I think that's the first thing. And I think the second thing, and this has been changing, you know, in the last decade or so, you know, is the fact that, you know, declined communities are often poor people of color. And I think, you know, some organizations have made indigent defense um, a priority, uh, but there's so many other priorities um, to compete with, you know, police misconduct, prosecutorial overreach, bail reform. Um, and, you know, I, you know, um, one thing that I'd like to try to remind people is that, you know, uh, I, I think the Sixth Amendment right to counsel is the most important criminal procedure provision. And, you know, even people like John Roberts have said it, you know, it's because the Sixth Amendment right to counsel protects access to all the other constitutional protections. Uh, but I think the problem is, you know, you know, the public may not understand the importance of that provision. Uh, and it's not as obvious when you think about things like police misconduct, prosecutorial overreach, kind of all the other issues um, tied to mass incarceration. Thank you. Um, so Sean, one of the areas that I thought was really interesting in, in your work was how you sort of brought us to um, the right, you intermingled right to counsel with the way that mass incarceration sort of became the, the popular polit political ideology in that there was a tough on, tough on crime, war on, war on drugs that uh, sort of led to mass incarceration, which then has an immediate effect on indigent defense. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how that came to be? Because you can sort of see now um, in the way that politics are kind of unfolding as you do see this, there's this focus on high crime rates. Um, you saw yesterday with the confirmation hearing, are you soft on crime, um, Judge Brown Jackson? Um, so those are the types of things that I'm seeing echoing now. So I'd love to hear sort of your historical view of how that happened, because it does lead to a lot of detrimental uh, policy for indigent people when you start to hear those buzzwords around, um, you know, people being soft on crime, that there are high crime rates, we need to get tough on crime. And so I, it, it makes me nervous when I start hearing that again, because we know what happened before. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about um, what happened before? And, and then I'll open it up to um, Irene and Larry. Yeah, so I mean, I think there's a, you know, there's a couple of moving parts and, you know, people have written about how the advances of the civil rights movement became con kind of conflated you know, with increases in crime in the 1960s and 1970s. So the idea is that, 
you know, these racial minorities got crazy, you know, once they got, you know, Title II and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, as well as all the other kind of statutory developments uh, in the 1960s, uh, as well as, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, to be pretty frank, like the reality of race riots in the 1960s, you know, particularly in the in 1968, um, after Dr. King was assassinated. So there was a way that kind of civil rights gains were civil rights gains in the specific context of race, but as well as kind of war and court um, developments uh, in the context of the fourth, fifth and sixth amendments all became conflated. Uh, and so beginning in the 1970s, you see this story around, um, again, you see the story about, you know, criminal defendants, you know, being found innocent because of legal technicalities, because of the uh, idea that judges were having too much solicitude to their rights and not to these real issues around crime that were like there, there were increases in crime uh, at the time. Um, so there was a conflation there. You know, people have written about backlash, and you know, really, what it meant um, is you know decreased support for indigent defense and the right to counsel. You know, but by by that time, most people had accepted the idea that people who are accused of crimes are entitled to a public defender or entitled to um, some kind of state supported um representation so that proposition was accepted but then there came became questions about quality you know there became questions about competence uh, and so that became the new domain of the new domain of um dispute in this area where people said okay we'll allow for this right but we're going to meagerly underfund um, public indigent defense, you know, whether we're talking about state offices, county based offices, um, assigned counsel, it became a situation where, you know, many, many um, local governments began to seriously underfund indigent defense, you know, it became an instance where it didn't even become a question around whether the federal government should be more involved in providing funding for indigent defense in the same ways that they are for police departments, for example. And part of it was tied to this idea is that all you need is some kind of representation, but you know, we're not going to seriously fund it because of these concerns around crime, concerns around drugs, um, so, um, concerns around um, race-based offending. Uh, and so really in the 70s and the 80s, you begin to see a lot of decisions that really shrink the kind of promise, you know, promise that Gideon was supposed to offer and kind of lead to, to um, the world that we inhabit today. So that, you know, really by the 1990s and the 2000s, you know, the Supreme Court wasn't hearing many substantive right to counsel cases. Most of the cases had to deal with ineffective assistance of counsel and tinkering around at the doctrine, but not the same kind of monumental decisions that you had in the 60s and the early 70s. Anyone else want to add um, to this this idea that um, you know, as we sort of get into the space of mass incarceration, um, you know, how does that how has that impacted this right to counsel? Um, I would love to hear, you know, Larry, you have I know a lot of opinions about um, the the way we get here, but you know, are, are public defenders just another cog in the machine? How do we impact, what role do we play in mass incarceration? Especially when there's so much underfunding, there's these huge caseloads, you know, we do have, you know, the goodwill to sort of help people. But if you have this mass influx where you have these ideas around war on crimes, and today we're hearing even more about, you know, high crime rates, you're seeing a lot of media attention around high crime rates. Are we just another cog in the machine? What role can we play um, to really help the defense function? Listen to our clients. Uh, we all know the phrase public pretender. So uh, can we be a cog in the wheel? Absolutely, yes we can. I've seen it, I've been ashamed by it, uh, and I've been ashamed by any association uh, 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 with it. 
within uh, my own practice uh, because we have to be client-centered and listen uh, to uh, what the clients are telling us uh, in, their, in their stories. Um, but we also have to do some of the things, some of the things that Sean has said uh, today and some of the things that are in his article. I mean, I've been doing this 25 years and I never heard it. But we, we don't have a systemized way of the, the things that Irene went through with Gideon's Promise of letting you know the basis of what it means to be a public defender. And so, uh, because when I came into the field as a public defender, it was really just based kind of like on TV of what I'd seen on, on TV. I wanted to have uh, Perry Mason moments, you know? And having a Perry Mason moment is about the attorney and about the experience the attorney is having. It says, aha, I caught you, you're a lion, we know it. I'm the best person in here. My person's not guilty. We all walking out, boom. Right. But I was having that experience. Uh, you know, maybe the maximum I could have it was 12 times a year, which meant that for my other 150 clients, what was I doing for them? And so after I had a stint in juvenile court, uh, what the kids were telling me was they wanted to go home. And that what became important for me is to figure out how I could get them home. And sometimes their case didn't matter. It didn't have anything to do with what I needed to do to get them home. It was superfluous. And so what we've done to communities is certain communities, we've denied them access to housing. We've denied them access to education. We've denied them access to work, uh, to play. We've denied folks access for trees, right? Because they know that in the area where it gets hot, there's more crime, right? So, I mean, just all of those uh, uh, at fundamental levels. And so, uh, where do we have to go uh, for public defense? Um, it's, it's really trying to make sure that you understand who you are. I, I think that we talked about uh, earlier, um, uh, uh, Jeffrey Shears. Uh, Irene, what did you talk about earlier? Why don't you, you talk about uh, uh, Jeffrey Shear and his, uh, the way that he thought about things? Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, Jeff Shear um, uh, was, um, so as I mentioned before, we, we spoke um, to those of you on the call, we spoke a little before this uh, panel gathered, um, and I described, you know, the model that I came up in as a, one of the, the newer attorneys in New Orleans. I was trained with the Gideon's Promise Program in Jeff Shear, Kentucky, talked to us about motivation for being a public defender. Um, I spoke about it because, you know, that's going to be part of my research going forward is how we can sort of tie different motivations to different office cultures and get a sense of, you know, how they would fit in different sort of office cultures. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I, uh, I think what, what I'd sort of add, so to Monica's question about, you know, whether or not public defenders are just a cog in the mass incarceration machine, I, um, I respect and adore and support public defense so much that I could never see it as that, right? Especially if it's done with the right motivations to steal a popular colloquialism, you know, however those would be as we define what those are. Um, I think it's important and what I try to do in my work is to look at some of the other, you know, the, the barriers that are in place or the, the things that prevent public defenders from doing the work that they're supposed to do and that they want to do. You know, it might just be, you know, my immigrant background or just my, you know, my hope for the world and that I think there's something profound and kind of beautiful about this idea that we claim to live in a country that is so protective of individual liberties that even if you are guilty, obviously confessed in everything, evidence, videotaped evidence of the worst crime ever, the government is going to have to fund somebody to defend you and to support you on that, right? I think there's something beautiful about that, right? That idea. And it's just a matter of us actually living up to it. One of the classes I'm teaching this semester is a comparative criminal justice seminar, where I'm trying to look at how other countries handle the criminal process um, to see if there's something we can get from that. And the idea, the class, the idea for the class came from I was doing a presentation at a university in Korea, and I, I was having dinner with some of the other uh, people, and they mentioned to me that they were building a public defender in South Korea for the first time, but that they weren't going to have quite the same problems that we had because they didn't have quite the same. Uh, racial, uh, racialized history. And I, I'm sort of like, mm, I'm sure about that. But also, you know, <laughs> that that suggests to me that maybe other countries are doing something 
right that we can look to or that we can get, you know, gain from to help public defenders do their job. And one of the countries that Germany, I think, you know, one of the things I was looking at just a little while ago, when I bring it up is, you know, there, the, the role in which we have the jury, the jury system play in our criminal process would be very foreign to them. Right. Um, and, and maybe that's something we can look at the, the, the judges, one of some of my research looks at how, you know, we, we applaud this idea of the judge as a neutral arbiter, right? But should the judge be a neutral arbiter in the face of certain rights that we're seeing being diminished, right? Um, we talk about the prosecutor's role. Well, to what extent should the prosecutor's role actually be about how do I make sure the public defender can do their job, right? You know, these are different things that we can do in the process to make it actually live up to these ideals that we have. Um, uh, you know, some people will describe that as me thinking, differently about the system or trying to present something new, but I, I don't think so. I think that's all sort of embedded in what we claim to be doing and that we just actually need to identify, address it and make it so. Yeah, Irene, um, I, I really um, am interested in what you're saying about that we're so about individual rights uh, and that um, one of the things I, I don't think that we talk about enough is the rights of the victim uh, in these cases uh, to to be heard. And because the first thing a criminal defense attorney says to the client is not guilty. And so that interrupts the natural process that people would, 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 would go in between. And so I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is that um, I'm not sure we're as victim oriented as we need to be, because I had many that would choose. I mean, most people don't call the police when something happens, right? Because they, they know well, well, for whatever reason. And then those that do call the police, a lot of them didn't want the penalties associated. They wanted healing, but they didn't necessarily want the penalties. And so to me is uh, how can we augment our court system so that it has uh, some restorative uh, justice uh, that can be done uh, before cases even filed? Many rich people get their cases uh, resolved. And so they never have anything on their record. Why, you know, they say that rich people get, uh, uh, what do you call them, arbitrators, right? So why can't poor people get an arbitrator to help them mediate their dispute? But if something has to get filed, why can't we have things that then feed back to a community from court or even restorative justice that happens after a person's been convicted or they are in prison? We, I, I, I think we need some more robust ways that we can help people. Uh, I mean, if it's about, if it's, if it's about healing, then I think that's a lot different than an adversarial uh, system. Uh, and so I think that there are certain ways that we can uh, uh, grow um, uh, to have uh, more things available. Uh, like when we're talking about other countries, there weren't always prisons, right? And so we are addicted to punishment here in this country. And when you go to the doctor's office, they don't bring in another human being and beat on them because you are in pain. So, uh, and I think what we, we know is that hurt people hurt people. And so if we can get to a point where uh, we're, we're, we're using our systems to get to root causes to remove the hurts, uh, that's, where, uh, we, that's where we can get the most relief. And that might all not always be through a criminal justice system. Although I think what we have is a criminal punishment system. I just want to quickly add to something Larry said um, about, at least in terms of like the disputes between rich people. Um, the last, I, I teach criminal law and the like last two or three classes, um, I teach like current controversies in criminal law. And, you know, I spend a day talking about white collar crime, um, but also talk about it throughout the semester um, and uh, have them read some work on these like deferred prosecution agreements that banks are able to receive. Um, I think HSBC has probably received the most. Uh, and every year so far, I've gotten this question about how come poor people don't get these kinds of deferred prosecution agreements? So I, I just think it's a great point to kind of think about the ways that you know people who are accused of the crimes of crimes um, that most of the people on this call are representing, you know, may not have access you know to the same kind of dispute resolution tools. Uh, that people who are accused of some would argue much more serious crimes are able to avail themselves of. 
Yeah, I mean, who are the biggest drug dealers? It's Walmart and Costco uh, and it's the Saddlers. And uh, when they get in trouble, they give over billions of dollars. Uh, but when it's our, 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 our folks, poor folks all around the country who got hooked on these uh, different drugs that they were pumping out, uh, they go to jail, they go to prison, they lose their homes. Uh, and, um, you know, to me, uh, that's a sign of serious, uh, <clears throat> um, I mean, that's a serious problem. Um, and I think we're criminalizing too many people. And I think that one thing is that we've had this myth of criminalization and that who the criminal was, was the darker your skin color, the more you were a criminal. And so uh, when we've had the thing about the welfare queens and all those things, what that said to white people, as long as I increase these criminal punishments, it's not gonna apply to me. Is this gonna apply to black people? And, uh, and so we, we, we know that just like Gideon, we know that stuff, if it affects white people, they will show up to change some stuff. And we've had with the opioid crisis, they have been pumping in all sorts of resources uh, to help uh, with that because it's affected them. And I know sometimes when I was in court, I'd have white people come in and go, this is how court really works. And I'd be like, yep, this is how it really works. And I go, wow, this sucks. And I go, yes, it does. And that's why you, we need to go and change this stuff so that uh, we are not criminalizing everybody and taking away uh, people's ability to vote, have a job uh, and have family. And we recognize that even if people do commit crimes, uh, um, it's often uh, when they're young, it's often when they're hurt and people change over time. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think we need to re uh, reflect that. I know Washington no longer has, uh, has, has parole. And I think it's something that uh, we need to, to bring back, which, you know, maybe that's outside of the role of what a public defender is supposed to be thinking about, about when their client uh, gets out. But for a client, their case is not over until the day they go free. And so for me, for public defense, I think we need to expand our horizons about what we're doing uh, so that we are, are, are doing in full service to the client uh, uh, to what their needs are and that we as the attorney uh, help them uh, get that. I want to move into family law. I want to move into family law because those, that's the problem my client has. Does that mean me as the criminal practitioner knows family law? No, but can it be in my office? Yes. Uh, can I make a, a, a warm handoff referral so my client doesn't have to go through the trauma of figuring out all that on their own? And, you know, that's what I think we need to get rid of is doing this on our own and getting divided. Thanks. I, I do want to turn to one of the questions that we had in um, from the viewers. Um, what do you see as the limitations of the adversarial system in adv advancing racial justice? What would a more equitable system look like? So solve all the problems, guys, in the next two to three minutes. <laughs> but I know you all have really uh, have done some work around um, what equity looks like and um, either professionally or in your, in your work. So, so please share what, what ideas you have around that. You know, I'll probably, you know, I'll start with just one small little nugget in saying that I'm not sure a different system would work that much better. When I look at the inquisitorial system and how much sort of um, we're relying on a judge to look at the files and make all their decisions based on that, I'm not sure that would help us given our history and our, our current status in terms of how we marginalize people. Um, for me, you know, my work is, you know, of course, there's, I, I, I do a lot on criminal law. I do a lot on clients themselves, but I'm, I am always trying to figure out how we can center the, the public defender and their job and their, and they can do the work better. Cause I think if we, if we can increase their ability, if we can make it uh, more sound, uh, I think we can maybe gain something with the adversarial system, right? I think there's something to be said about having an individual whose sole job is to protect this person that's accused of a crime and to make sure that their, you know, their rights are vindicated, that they're able to re-enter the community in whatever sort of um, successful, stable way that they would need to. 
um, to ensure progress going forward and, and, and positive life outcomes. Um, so that's just my little nugget. Um, I get it. I do, you know, there's certainly a lot of problems with the adversarial system, but I also think there's a lot of, you know, problems with the inquisitorial system. I'm not so sure. The restorative justice process is really exciting and it's, um, it's also attractive to me to an extent. But then I think at the, be you know, the beginning conversation you would have with the client um, in terms of the restorative justice process and how the person, whether or not the person would feel that you are their supporter, or if you're just trying to figure out some way to make the, the, the alleged victim, you know, more sound or something like that. And so I think that could be risky as well. I, I, I'll say two things. I think for restorative justice, there's gotta be the choice of both. And if your client wants to go to trial, then we need to be there to go to trial. And what I wanna talk about is the wildebeest. I was watching Will Smith and he was out on safari and there was the wildebeest and there was a river and the wildebeest had to get across the river. Well, one wildebeest went across the river and the, and the alligator came and just ate them up, ate them up, ate them up. And so what that reminds me of is our trial system is that 97% of all cases are ending in a plea. But what if all the wildebeest, all the wildebeest rose up together and came into that river and we all went to trial, baby. We all went to trial, all of us. And by all of us, I just mean like 50% of us went to trial, this system would break down. And we would also, you know, to me, you know, that I think that's what we need to do to get healthy as public defense is how can we put ourselves in a position to say, no, we're not taking your deal and we're gonna go to trial because they can't try all the cases. They can't try their way out. And so once they can't try their way out, they gotta figure out another way. We have to be healthy enough uh, in mind, spirit, body, office culture in order uh, to do that. And you got to be as expensive as hell because we worth it, right? Because we do hard work. So it should cost a lot to get a public defender, right? To pay all our loans because we are the protectors of the Constitution. That's what we do on a daily, baby. That's what we do. We protect people. We go out there swinging every day for them because we love them, because they deserve it. Even if we don't love them, even if we don't like them, that's what we do. We, we, we're there to fight. And that's what we got to be there to do, baby. Faith all the way. Because that's what the client wants. That's what they want to see in the courtroom. They want to see you going there. You're getting in there at that witness. Getting in there for them. That's what we can do with public defense. All the time. Every day. And they go, oh, I ain't going to mess with that guy. I, I, went to, I went to the restaurant the other day and I heard some legislators talking. And it was like, oh, this public defender showed up. And the client did this and that. And it was horrible. And that public defender was crazy for that client. That's what I want to hear about public defenders. That's what I want to hear. That's what I want to hear. That's what we can do, and we can do it together. That's what I want to do with each and every one of you, is reach out to you. I'm going to be hanging out with Irene. I'm going to be hanging out with Sean. I'm going to be hanging out with Monica. I can go through all the participants, and we can do this together, right? Just like Gideon's army, we raise up, we rise up, and we represent, and we resist. I'm stealing from NAPD right there. <laughs> it's okay to steal. If it's good, that's what I'm talking about, baby. So come on with me. Fight with me, baby. Come on. Let's do this. Man, thanks for firing everybody, <laughs> everybody up today. Um, so we did have a kind of a follow-up question about sort of things that you were saying, Larry, which is take everything to trial and it, the system would collapse under its own weight. Um, uh, Aaron, um, in our in our Q and A, asked, um, "Isn't that what the pandemic did?" But the only people who suffered from that were, were the clients. So, what do you think about that? Do you think that it would um, that that gets into and, and maybe Irene, you have some thoughts because you do the ethics thing. But what, is it ethical? You know, that's what something sometimes we struggle with is for the overall defense function, it benefits it because it would force some things to happen. But the individual client, does that, um, do you pose a risk in, in your ethical duty to the client by pushing everything to trial? Of course, we understand about the trial penalty um, and how that impacts, you know, sentencing, you know, you take everything to trial, some people are going to get um, lengthy sen sentences. So, um, you know, what do you think about that? What are the risks that are, um, that are there for, for taking in all the trials? 
I think you've identified some really important risks that we have to take into account, right? No, I think you're absolutely, I mean, that's one of the struggles, even with my research, with my work as a public defender, with my work doing definitely work in Alabama before that, and how I even think about the world is that I want so much to change, but I don't want that change at the expense of people who don't, who don't have a say in it, right? You know what I'm saying? Or, or just looking to me to help make their everyday experience a little bit better. And, and with that, I include both clients, right? And I include the actual like public defenders, the line attorneys, the social workers, the investigators, everybody that's working at the office to try to improve the experience of the clients. There are a lot of ways in which I think um, the system should be changed. And, and some of it could involve, you know, taking steps that would cause it to, to metaphorically literally crash, right? But at every stage, when I think about those things, I think about who's actually going to suffer the consequence consequences as I sit in my office and continue to come up with theories for improvement, you know? Um, so I try to figure out realistic ways uh, to address it and, uh, or I shouldn't say realistic because, you know, it could happen. Right. Uh, but, um, you know, I, 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 some might say I move a little bit too slowly. Right. Because I feel like one of the first steps is we just need to figure out what's going on. Like some of my projects are about just like, how are states like organizing the public defender? Who are the supervisors? What happens if a public defender says, I can't do this. I cannot meet my constitutional obligation or my ethical obligation. What happens to them within their office? What happens to their office as a whole? What does the state bar do about it? In one of my projects right now, I'm looking at how attorneys uh, can learn from sort of any mistakes that they've made in past cases where a client has been convicted and then it's overturned. You know, how does the office respond to that, you know, the office that, you know, employed the attorney that, you know, may, may have made a, a mistake that was just unknown or something like that. But then also, how does the state bar respond to that? The state bar, you know, there's a lot of issues with it because it's lawyers basically governing other lawyers, right? But it, you know, it set itself forth as this institution, this agency, this body that is responsible for the provision of services, right, at a certain level throughout the nation. And, and it has, you know, to my mind, been unsettlingly quiet when it comes, insufficiently noisy at least, when it comes to the state of public defense and public defenders, the attorneys themselves, that they license to do the work. Um, so I think these are all sort of steps we can take short of, of crashing the entire system um, that won't be as potentially harmful to individual clients and the individual staff um, that's trying to do the work. So I think we have couple more minutes. Um, I guess my my final question, and, and you all can sort of give your closing um, as well. Um, Larry, I know you have to jump, jump off. So if you need to go, you can, you can go because I know you got to fight the good fight. Um, but I did want to ask, um, Sean, given what your research has been um, about the way the system has operated in the past, is there anything, any tea leaves that you can read? Can you give us an idea of where the system is headed? What's in your crystal ball? Because I'm seeing a lot of repeated, some, some repeats of history. Maybe some things are different. We have progressive prosecutors now, whatever that means. What's, what can you imagine in the future for, for indigent defense as much as it impacts the same groups of people? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, that's, that's a, it's a tricky question. Um, you know, I, I'll say, I mean, a, a few things. Um, one, is that's kind of evident in this panel, um, it's just a kind of recognition and increasing recognition of how race plays a role in the work of indigent defense um, that I think is, you know, certainly um, warms my heart. Uh, and, and I think is um, productive in that people are recognizing that the kind of like anti-poverty work involved in being public defender is different from being anti-racist work. Uh, so I think that's a positive development um, uh, that, I, that I think will continue to develop. Uh, and, and I think, and, I, and, I, and, I, and that I see with my students, I should say, um, with students who want to do public interest law. Uh, and I think the other thing is kind of, um, kind of tied to kind of developments around holistic defense. Um, which I know like the, is, is actually, you know, I, I think there's some, a little bit of controversy around holistic defense and that some people think that doing that kind of work is actually hard and that some public defender offices don't have the resources 
to engage in it. Um, but what I'll say, and you actually kind of gestured to it um, in your question about kind of seeing some familiar themes, like, you know, part of what I write about uh, in my work is how, you know, some of these abolitionist societies in the 1830s and 1840s, particularly vigilance committees that were organized by free Black people, they engaged in holistic services. So they're, when they're helping formerly enslaved persons who escaped to cities like Philadelphia and New York City uh, and Boston, you know, they were helping, getting, helping people with legal representation primarily, but also helping people uh, with housing, with employment, with food. Uh, and I think there's increasingly a recognition, you know, whether people adopt holistic services or not, there's increasingly a recognition that sometimes the work of public defend being a public defender involves not just legal representation, you know, but other issues uh, tied to the needs of a, a client. And I think irrespective of whether people adopt the holistic model, I see that as something that a positive development that public defenders, I think, are going to increasingly recognize. Oops. Did you have any last thoughts, Irene, before we close out? Uh, you know, I'm always hesitant to try to follow up Sean. <laughs> he always, his words are always so, so profound. I'll, I'll just add that, you know, to, to consistent with what Sean says, it's, it's, it's great seeing some of the, the conversations and things that, you know, my students are having. It's wonderful seeing all the people here and then seeing from the chat, all the different comments. Uh, Larry's passion, I think, is something that's very exciting. And then I just think about, you know, when I started off as a public defender in New Orleans back in now 2008, I think my, uh, my friend Shante Parker, who also started with me, is on, on this call as well. You know, part of what I had never thought about being an academic at all. And the reason I considered being an academic is I was there and realizing there just wasn't anything written or thought about when it comes to state public defense, you know, so there was no attention in terms of how do, how should this operate? How should this look? How should this work? And so it's been encouraging over the last few years to be part of that increased conversation. Uh, and, and I think that that bodes well for the future. Um, I'm hopeful based on that. Thank you. So I, we're, we're over time. So uh, obviously this has been such a great uh, discussion. Um, and I really wanna thank our panelists uh, for joining me today. This has been something I've been working on for a while and I'm so happy to see all of your faces. Um, so on behalf of NACDL, I wanna thank you for joining. Um, and for those that are interested in reading more of the written work of our panelists, it will be um, emailed out to you once we have a recording available for the video. So you will get to see their awesome work. They write about a ton of really cool things. And I encourage you all to, to take a look, especially given that so many people have said that they've never heard of some of this stuff before. Get into the academia. They are talking about some really important stuff. Um, and as I mentioned, the recording for this program will be made available on NACDL's web website. And I will also put it on um, our Strengthening the Six website. Um, if you don't mind, Randy, putting up our survey, um, there's a QR code. Please take our survey. It really helps us um, develop programming, learn more about what you guys want to see in the future. Um, so I'll let him leave that up there for a second. And you'll also probably get that survey in your emails. So you should take five minutes to just fill that out and help us uh, develop more programming in the future. <laughs>